today I'm going to interview a set of unconscious priests. As most of you know, I'm not a set of unconscious. You may have also noticed that I avoid getting into arguments of set of accountism versus non set of account. And I'm going to do a video on why that is so in about a month. I do feel that I have much more in common with a traditional priest who rejects the Second Vatican Council, even if he is a set of accountants, than with a neo traditionalist who tries to twist, contort, and rationalize why the Second Vatican Council is implicit. When somebody accepts the council, errors inevitably follow. I'm much more likely to hear good homilies and other good and profitable things from a true traditional priest than from a neo-traditional priest. And today, we're going to express the positives and the commonalities. Today, I'm interviewing Father Stephen Lafour, a traditionalist priest belonging to the newly formed Association of Priests for the Restoration of Catholic Life. And I have that link down below. Father Lafour was conditionally ordained a Catholic priest on the feast day of Our Lady of Loretto on December 10th of 2020. Five years earlier to that, he was a priest in the Novus Ordo, who was ordained for the Novus Ordo Church on the feast day of Our Lady of the Miraculous Bell on November 28th, 2015. Welcome, Father Lafour. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, this is the first time we talk face to face, uh, and uh, it, it seems like you have a, a incredible spiritual journey that you've undertaken and in a, a relatively short period of time I'd like to hear more about your spiritual journey uh I, I under i assume that you were born to a catholic family can you tell me about that yes yeah, so i'm i'm the middle of three children uh to a uh, was born in 1987 so i'm 33 years old now um i was born into a, a nova sordo family just because all they had uh, where i was at was the nova sordo so we, we grew up catholic walking distance from a parish and uh all i knew was catholicism uh growing up i was influenced uh solely by catholicism from what i understood it and then also uh, a few protestants here they're sprinkled in uh and always questioned me why i believe what i believe and i knew that uh you know someone asked me as a as a boy, I remember being, uh, you know, in the grade school and a Methodist girl in the grade school I went to, she asked me, you know, do I have a personal relationship with Jesus? And I said, well, I receive him in Holy Communion, you know, but I didn't know how to respond to it other than, you know, I receive him in Holy Communion. So I don't know what you mean by personal relationship, you know. Uh, and so evidently that that answer wasn't sufficient for her. It was sufficient for me, but I didn't know why uh, it was sufficient. And so that always irked me, um, but the uh, until much later, things started becoming more clear as I started learning the faith. But I, I began, uh, I guess, my journey, if I can begin, uh, I guess, to give a, a background of my vocation. My mother and father are still together after almost 40 years of marriage, thanks be to God. And my father was my hero growing up, and I wanted to be just like him. Uh, so I wanted to have a wife and children, and I wanted to be a father as my father was to me. And so the first memories of being alive was actually him coming home from work, jumping into his arms with my older brother uh, before my sister was born and uh, playing with him till the sun would go down and he'd read us to sleep, would say our prayers, our father, hail Mary, glory be, and then God bless everybody in the whole wide world and go to bed. And I knew that my father loved me and I didn't want anything else but uh, the love of my parents and especially the love of my father. And so he provided that for me. And so when I became nine years old, I became aware that um, it was vocations a week in the little public school, uh, Catholic school that I attended. And I had a picture of a, of a priest praying in the pew of a church uh, or a man sitting in the pew of a church. And it said, thinking about priesthood, pray about it. And I thought to myself at nine years old in third grade, if I don't become a priest, who would? And uh, that thought scared me as a nine year old. And I thought to myself, well, I don't wanna be a priest because then I can't have a wife and children. And I can't be a father as my father was to me. So I, I said, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to play video games. I want to play sports. I don't want to kiss girls. I, you know, so that was what God allowed me to do for five years, uh, more or less um, successfully. <laughs> and once I hit puberty, the, the, the cruel age of 14, um, I went to confession with a priest. And I was very honest with him in the confessional about the struggles I was having. Uh, and he said, you know, Stephen, you're about one in a hundred. And I thought to myself, well, I don't want to be just one in a hundred. I want to be, you know, uh, one in a million, you know. And so I didn't know what he's talking about. But two weeks later, there was a call by name letter from the bishop of the diocese. And it's back in 2002, uh, right at the um, height of the um, Boston Globe scandals uh, of 
of pre-sex abuse scandals. And so to have a call by name letter at that time, my mom was vehemently against me discerning the priesthood, she did not want me to lose my soul being a priest, especially with the, the uh, deviancies that she was aware of and she wanted to shield me from. And, but when I read the letter, uh, she saw this light envelop me. And the letter said, dear Stephen, I invite you with this, uh, to this possibility to discern uh, you've been spotted in your parish to have the possibility of becoming a good priest who invites with no pressure, no obligation to discern the possibilities of the priesthood. So I said to myself three things. Wow, the bishop knows my name. <laughs> number two, he thinks I can be holy enough to be a priest. And number three, uh, he believe, uh, you know, if God is calling me to the priesthood, I guess I'll say yes, because I don't want to tell God no. And that was probably the most influential part of that whole letter. So Joining the support group of young men, I was I was exposed to something that I had never seen before in my 14 years of Catholic life in America. And that was I saw young white American males on fire for the love of God. And they were normal and they played sports. Uh, they, they, they were just typical teenage boys, but they were in love with the love of God. And I never saw that before, that it was possible to be a young Catholic man on fire for the love of God and had this joy that I wanted. And so it began this desire and thirst within me to begin desiring God's will in my life. And I was told, you know, do God's will and you'll be happy from this day going forward, no matter what circumstances you find yourself in. It's good advice. You know, whatever walk of life, you know, do God's will, you will be happy and you will have peace. So uh, thus began a journey. I went on retreat shortly thereafter. It was actually May 31st on this retreat. And I received uh, the gift of tears and the profound love of God the Father. It was right before uh, midnight mass. Um, keep in mind the Nova Sordo that uh, that's the feast day of the visitation when Mary visits Elizabeth. And it's the first instance of Eucharistic adoration when John the Baptist leaps in the womb and the presence of the divine Lord in the womb of Mary. So I, I, I said a prayer to God that it wasn't an Our Father, a Hail Mary, and a Glory Be. And I said, God, you've led me so far to show that how good you are, whatever you want me to do with my life, I'm going to do it because you're so amazing. I, you sure are awesome. I, I want you to work in my life. Um, and at that moment, the Holy Spirit of God uh, rushed into my heart and my heart erupted with the love of God, the Father, and my soul was subsumed in the presence of the Father's love in this furnace of love. I started crying my eyes out, being so fulfilled of the fa God, the Father's love. And I'd never felt that love before so fulfilling that I didn't want anything else but this moment with him, this unity with him, a communion with him. And I said, can I think of anything else other than you in this moment? I couldn't. God consumed all my thoughts. And so because of that, uh, God, I said, God, keep, this is heaven. Keep me here forever. And that he opened up my eyes and um, I, peace had flooded my soul and silence sat on the church. And, you know, uh, the spirit, the, the, the voice of God, the father spoke to me in the most loving fatherly voice I've ever heard in my life. And he said, you feel the love that I'm giving you. I want you to share this love with others. And that's all he said. And this being the core of my vocation, this, this one line, you feel the love I'm giving you. I want you to share this love with others. And so I knew in that moment in the core of my soul that I had to be a priest. I had to be totally devoted to God, the father, so that I could be the living expression of his love on earth. And shortly after that experience went into mass and the Holy Ghost began teaching me the parts of the mass, why we have a liturgy of the word at the time and a liturgy of the Eucharist. And so uh, and then when it got time to um, the elevation of the host. Uh, and this is very pivotal. It's very important uh, because then I started hearing the voice of Christ uh, very vividly, uh, powerfully, like locution of Christ's voice. And uh, when the priest elevated the, the precious body of our Lord, the voice of Jesus spoke and he said, you see what this priest is doing. I want you to do this for the rest of your life. And I told Jesus after this experience of God, the father, I said, well, if you are the love of God, the father, then I say yes. And then the priest elevated the chalice. And again, Jesus said, I want you to do this for the rest of your life. And at that point, I, I responded forever. And that began the 
the momentum of changing my whole life. The, those, the, that experience that night, May 31st, uh, 2002. Uh, so moving forward, I had to finish high school, of course, you know, so I dated throughout high school. I tried to, you know, uh, devote myself to study uh, to the to the holy to at least the Catholic faith as much as possible. I discovered Scott Hahn. I discovered Dr. Brant Petrie. I uh, discovered uh, a wonderful uh, Catholic theologians and apologists, and I began falling in love with the dogmas and doctrines of the faith. And so, when I got to graduate high school, uh, going into seminary was a natural step. And uh, I had. Everything going for me, the diocese was behind me. They felt that, you know, I had a lot to go. Uh, God was calling me to this and they were very, and I, I get along with everybody. I'm very uh, gregarious and much, very much a people person. I love listening to people and uh, quote unquote meeting people where they're at. <laughs> um, but I also believe in bringing people up too, and that I can come down. I'm, I'm going to pull you up. You're not going to bring me down. So there's certain people that I just don't associate with because I don't want to be brought down unless people want to get pulled up. Uh, so in the seminary, I helped a number of people, but there was, again, there was this piece. As soon as I went to the seminary grounds and I knew that I was going to spend the next eight to nine years in seminary formation uh, to be formed into a priest. And this was an Obus Ordo seminary. Uh, I studied philosophy. I studied theology. And I would explain it as the introduction to the redemption and renewal of my mind, uh, studying proper philosophy, studying proper theology. I had very good uh, teachers in the seminary. I would say that I hit it uh, the seminary timeline at just the right moment to get the best professors. Um, I was not very articulate with writing as I am now uh, well, what, when what, I first what, began. Father, well, what do you mean by you hit it at the right time? Uh, like. And, uh, Pope Benedict was around. Is, is that I'm not sure. right? So I graduated high school in 2006, and, and Pope Benedict had been the Pope his early on in his pontificate. And so there was a shift, a strong shift to strong philosophy and strong theology in this renewal of the liturgy, of the reform of the reform. I would say was the was the main thrust. Uh, this this phrase uh, to restore the sacred uh, was floating around in the seminary. And we also had professors who uh, were formed in the JP2 generation, but had resisted a lot of the um, uh, liberalism, I would say it in the church. And uh, th they taught us a very good, uh, there were some holes. I mean, th there were, you know, but, but I learned Augustine, I learned Thomas, well, I can't say learned ex explicitly Thomas Aquinas, unfortunately, there was not necessarily totally Thomistic. Uh, but it did have a, a flavor of Catholicism attached to it. Of course, this is the Nova Sordo. It's laced with modernistic tendencies to prop up the Second Vatican Council. And so, you know, from all I knew at that point, I'm starting at a tabula rasa. I'm a Catholic who's becoming Catholic, who's becoming more Catholic, who's becoming more Catholic, as we all should. A life of conversion every moment, you know, responding to grace. God's calling us closer to himself. And so it's going to refine us more and more uh, into his heart and less and less of the world. So I would say that I was prepped in the Novus Ordo Seminary to pursue the truth and go through the redemption and renewal of my mind and always ask questions. And that and most importantly, I had a, a seminary professor, um, theolo uh, theological history, which is church history. He went through the line of the popes. And uh, he made sure not to cover the Second Vatican Council. Uh, he made sure not to cover the Council of Pistoia. Uh, but he did cover uh, hardline heresies very well. And he did put, you know, he did say, you know, going through the lines of the popes in church history, uh, he did give us a, a very important phrase that I carry with me, that nothing just happens. Nothing just happens. You know, we see this catastrophic worldwide event of a political nature and we wonder, you know, oh, that's pretty fascinating, you know, you know, and uh, I guess that's what it is. You know, well, no, no, something caused it. People caused this to happen that are in control. And there's overarching motivations and overarching philosophies that dictate, you know, these world events that are occurring. You know, they don't just happen. And so people think long and hard before they act about doing something very serious. You know, so even in the case of my own life, to the fact that I, now I'm a state of a contest, it did not just happen. There were certain things that had to happen that led up to this point. So 
I would say that I um, very much uh, enjoyed my seminary formation. I would say I, I fell in love with the heart of the church. I was in the heart of the church. I didn't have to, I, I had heard these things about the hierarchy. I started watching church militant in the seminary uh, and theology in particular after uh, or Barack, uh, Barack, after Barack Obama became president and gave a speech at Notre Dame University, I knew something was wrong, that the hierarchy in, in Chicago could allow this uh, abomination to happen, and these, these hierarchy in Indiana could allow this abomination to happen, this child killer in chief. And so it began questioning, what, what is it in the Novus Ordo world that allows these kinds of evils to endure? Because again, nothing just happens. So, but again, I was very naive, hope springs eternal. Uh, I'm a very gregarious and accepting person of most people. And so I give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, I might've heard corruption about some bishops over there, but certainly couldn't have been my bishop. Uh, certainly couldn't have been the neighboring bishop, couldn't have been the, the bishop that's running the seminary, you know, couldn't have been, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z, couldn't be the Holy Father. You know, of course he's trying to fight all these corruptions. But then you realize when the, when, the, when the wool is lifted, you realize they're, they're complicit in all of this. And so anyway, I, again, at this point, it's this 2014, 15, I'm a transitional deacon and, I, and I'm also a, soon a priest, the Novus Ordo. I, I loved uh, the Novus Ordo with all my heart. I wanted to re restore the sacred. Uh, I wanted to bring as much incense to the liturgy as possible. Uh, I wanted to, and this was a sign, I wanted to keep my canonical digits together after the consecration of the host. And I was told by my seminary formators, you can't do that. That's against the rubrics. And, uh, and I, I thought, that's interesting. Okay, so I'm going to be obedient to Holy Mother Church, but I'm wondering why Holy Mother Church is asking me to keep my canonical digits apart and why to wipe them on the corporal. And there's no way of properly purifying the corporal uh, and making sure that particles of our blessed Lord are taken care of. Uh, so these things that I kept in mind, I filed away in the back of my head. But again, I'm naive at this point. I'm 27, 28 years old. Uh, I trust the hierarchy has my best interests at heart. And so when I promised respect and obedience to the Novus Ordo Bishop at the time, who, by the way, on the eve of the year of mercy, gave a homily, beautiful homily on always err on the side of mercy. <laughs> uh, so, so funny enough, the, uh, there was nine weeks into my Novus Ordo priesthood, I was hearing confessions of, of confirmation students. And this is where the story gets uh, radically different because uh, you'll hear uh, beforehand, before this point, you'll hear a lot of good consolations that come from God. He will hear very little of the cross. Now, there was a lot of, there were some crosses definitely in my formation. And I, I don't want to just simply gloss over that. There were crosses, but the majority of the, the cross that would define the rest of my life was about to ensue. Now, this also was going to ensue for a number of reasons. Number one, because God loves me and he has allowed the admonishment of his son and God admonishes all the sons that he loves. And if he doesn't admonish us, then we're bastards. We're not sons, according to Hebrews chapter 11. So that's the first thing. So an admonition for my own sins, uh, but then also to, uh, God allowed this to happen because of grace. I asked God in, in high school to be a saint. I said, God, I will be your priest if I can be your saint. Because if, I, if I'm not going to be a saint, if I'm not going to get to heaven, it's useless. So uh, my mom even told me as much. She said, Stephen, if you don't want to be a, a saint, then do not become a priest. Uh, because you will go to hell. And you know, this blood very strong, but very loving words from my mother. And so because I asked God to make me a saint, uh, he allowed what was going to happen in suit. So in nine weeks into my um, a Novus Ordo ordination, I was in the parish. Again, this parish was a circle church. It had a mummified Jesus on the crucifix. Um, I'm not describing any particular parish. This is a numbers of parishes, hundreds, thousands of parishes like this that have uh, objectively made the Bride of Christ ugly. Uh, and unapproachable uh, and uninspiring. Uh, so the, again, trying to work with it um, and, and work with it because this is the bride that I've given my life to and I'm going to work to restore her. I'm going to work to love her to back to health uh, again through the Novus Ordo. Uh, so I was hearing the confessions of these teenagers, they're confirmation students. They're under the age of 18. So they're 16 to 18, 16 to 17 years old. They're considered minors but they're about to be considered adults in the church in confirmation. So a number of these uh, penitents, it was obvious they had not 
examine their consciences. And I desire to give them the best opportunity as what I had understood at that time, you're as a priest, you're the judge and the juror, you know, and you have to see if this person is penitent enough to actually receive reconciliation. And so I examined these people in the confessional with going through the Ten Commandments. And of course, one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not commit adultery in the cases where there was adultery, or at least some sin that attached to it. Um, I, generalities don't work. The, the Catholic Church asks us to confess species and number. And it's not that I was trying to be creepy. I wasn't trying to be uh, uh, illicit in some form or fashion. I was trying to do my proper job as a priest, just as you would talk to your doctor about sensitive information. Uh, but that's between you and your doctor, and it's a professional situation. It's not, uh, you know, hey, let's do something creepy that we shouldn't be doing afterwards. No, it's nothing like that. And I've never come across that way to any present myself in any way to these children, to these, to these uh, teenagers in that capacity. So there were three to four people, uh, let's see, th four in particular that complained about how I heard their confessions. One of them had a mother and a live-in boyfriend and the live-in boyfriend that's constantly out of work, wanted a quick buck from the church, knew that he could uh, say, well, I'm gonna get the cops involved in saying that, you know, I broke all these boundaries with minors, the confessional, and just how, how terrible does that sound? I mean, it sounds terrible. I wanted to die when I found that, when I read the letters a few days later, um, in uh, deep remorse, you know, but I was set up to fail. Uh, I was, the way I was trained, not necessarily in the seminary system itself, but by one of the priests who I had modeled my priesthood after, who was in my diocese, was very charismatic, and had a very large following. I would consider him uh, probably the Joel Olstein of the priesthood, uh, health and wealth, gospel and prosperity, um, but very emotional, not necessarily grounded in um, the authentic teachings of the faith and disciplines of Holy Mother Church when it comes to practices in the confessional. So long story short, they end up sending me using the Dallas Charter because these accusations of, of breaking the Sixth Commandment with minors in the confessional, just because I asked these questions. It wasn't like this was a public, this, this was a public place. I was out in the nave of the church. I was out in the open. You know, I did not touch anybody. I didn't solicit anything. I wasn't, I wasn't asking for too many details, at least at, at I thought at the time, you know, in a turn, you know, so I was trying to do the best that I knew at the time as nine weeks a priest trying to do my job. So they enacted the Dallas Charter on me, uh, or at least the essential norms of the Dallas Charter. Honor, I'm not familiar with the Dallas Charter. Uh, could you so, explain it? So the Dallas Charter was uh, written by one Theodore McCarrick. He was the uh, principal. He shouldn't be, <laughs> you know, he should be on anyone's radar in tradition of understanding how, how crony he is, how crooked he is, how corrupt he is. Um, so you can, I won't go down that, that uh, if I can you know, quote uh, Archbishop Shupich, uh, I won't go down that rabbit hole, but it was, it was instituted as the norms to destroy priests who were accused, uh, not just credibly, but just if any accusation, they say any accusation is credible accusation. So uh, they, they use it to destroy priests and they send them away to a psychological hospital for, for evaluation. Then afterwards, if he's seen as uh, viable of going back to ministry, he can go back to ministry. If he's not seen as viable going back to ministry, he's cast aside. Okay, so they sent me to a place, and um, it, it has um, uh, probably for legal purposes, should not say the name of the place, but these places are known. You can do a Google search about, uh, I call them priest prisons. Now, th there's, it's a psychological hospital for priests. Now, it's a money racket. It's a scam. Uh, you go there as the patient, but you're not the client. The diocese is the client. Uh, and the doctors there and the nurses there, they, they, they say they mean well, but they, they get $30,000 a month if a priest stays for treatment. And usually it's six months at a time. So that's $180,000 per pop for, for a priest to stay the six months. So, and they say magically you're cured afterwards. So in order for the insurances and most dioceses have uh, very lush insurance policies incredible insurance policies and so it's not costing the bishop or the diocese anything to have the medical insurance you know pay for these priests to stay there for treatment well they diagnosed me as having a personality disorder unspecified you know just let that sink in have a personality disorder 
but it's unspecified. So they said, we know something's wrong with you, but we don't know what's wrong with you. And so you need to stay for treatment. And you seem a little bit stressed. Well, yes, I'm stressed because you're asking me all these questions of, uh, that you have no, you have no, no, no right to know these questions, to answer these questions. And I don't know the certainty of my future. You know, I don't know if I'm going back to ministry in the Nova Sordo or not. I don't know if I'm going back to ministry at all as a priest. You know, so of course my future is uncertain. You know, you say I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not at ease. Well, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden my life is thrown forward into this abyss. Of, I call it priest prison. It's and you're there as, um, you know, they got me to go through this sexual boundaries course. You know, and I had to go through my whole history, uh, which is very embarrassing. You know, and you go in front of all these other brother priests, they're sharing their histories and you see the corruption of, you know, this the human condition. I would just say it's the human condition. Um, there, were there other priests there at the same time? Oh, of course. I mean, you had 30 priests there at any given time. So, so I mean, yeah, this is a, this is a revolving door. It's not like, you know, they're helping one or two people. This is a money racket, some money. So the bishop wants to, this is the way it works. The bishops, the U.S. bishops, um, want to get rid of problematic priests in their opinion. And they send them to these psychological facilities. And then uh, the facilities want the priests to come because they get huge chunks of change. It's a multi-million dollar industry. Um, and they don't care really what happens to the priest. If he goes back into ministry, great. If he doesn't go back into ministry, it doesn't matter. We got paid. We did our, we did our job to help the bishops out as they're the CEOs. Uh, of the corporations that we call that the Novus Ordo calls the Catholic Church, but really it's a corporation uh, with a religious veneer. It has nothing to do with the Catholic faith. It has nothing to do with the Catholic Church. Um, it, by a stroke of a pen, they can de facto obstruct and deny the third commandment of the Decalogue and telling Catholics they don't have to uh, attend Sunday Mass. I mean, let that sink in. They, they, they are, take the place of God and just destroy and deny the third commandment of God to keep holy the Lord's day. Uh, so I, I just, just let that sink in. If these men have any credibility whatsoever, if you give them any, any, any inches, they destroy the third commandment of God. The, uh, so I survived the, the six months. When I got finished with the six months, the center actually said, you know, there's really nothing wrong with this guy. You can put him back in ministry, okay? And just let him be supervised. And so, again, hope springs eternal. I believe the bishop of my diocese is going to, you know, uh, say that, you know, I can go back to ministry. Sure, because the psychological center says I can go back. But however, uh, the bishop listening to his lawyers and insurance adjusters, who, again, have more power uh, than the bishop himself, uh, lawyers and insurance adjusters. You want power in the Catholic, in the, in the Novus Ordo Church, be a lawyer or an insurance adjuster. I guarantee you, you'll always have a job. Uh, now, because priests, all priests are, are employees. This is very important to, my, to the Novus Ordo priests out there. You are only an employee in a potential lawsuit of the CEO of the corporation. You are only an employee in potential lawsuit. And until you realize that your life does not matter to them, you're going to continue being obedient to disobedient men who defy the laws of God. So uh, I, I, I share that out of personal experience because I felt it because I gave my life to, quote unquote, the church. I gave my, uh, my whole life to her. And I, pro and I promise respect and obedience, knowing that I'm giving my whole life over that the church would provide for me in my times of need. And they have done nothing to provide in my times of need. In fact, in the, when the bishop was told that we want to put this guy back into ministry, he said, well, it would not benefit the diocese. And so he suggested that I work in Lowe's at, in the main city, like Lowe's, the, 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 uh, the hardware store. And so I said to myself, well, I need to be in a parish. I don't need to be working at a blue collar job. And, and of course, you know, one of the, the other priests in the, in the conversation on the phone uh, whose pastoral sensitivity is the, is, is negative 1000. Uh, he said, he said, well, you need to be one with the people or more one with the people, you know, and be one, of the, one like them. And, <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, I'm already one of the people I came from my parents. I came from my diocese. I'm native born. I'm a native son. How could I not benefit this diocese? my diocese. These are my people. I'm from them. I have the same blood. I share the same last name of many of these people. I, I, I share the same common experience in the language, you know, and 
uh, all the idioms and idiosyncrasies, you know, the festivities. I'm, I'm part and parcel. This is my culture. How, how could you say I don't benefit, you know, these people? So it was insulting to me. And this priest not, was also a foreigner, I should say. He was born from outside the United States. And he was doing what he could to brown nose his way up the ladder. The other issue uh, then was that, okay, well, well he, the bishop wanted me to write a letter of leave of absence. You know, and he said, work at the secular job that's not contrary to the clerical state. And if you think about that, that's actually contradictory. Uh, to work at a secular job that's not that's that's not contrary to the secular state um, to to the priestly state to the clerical state, and because a cleric is meant to work as a cleric, he's not work to not meant to work in a secular job, a blue collar job, even a white collar job if it's not a clerical job, you know, if it's not a priestly job, you know, I if you wanted me to cut the grass in the chancery, I would have and allowed me to do mass in the chancery, I would have done that. You know, okay, so I'm going to do blue collar. Let me do grounds work for the church and then let me do my and let me do mass. You know, let me, quote unquote, recover in your eyes to where you can trust me again. Uh, but they they didn't want that. They wanted to get away with me. So when I found myself on the plane landed coming back to home, I felt this black cloud over me. It was very ominous. And a brother priest who's a Monsignor from another diocese far, far away. He called me on the phone as I was at the baggage claim. And I was about to, this is uh, back in 2008, uh, 2016 in August. I just got back home uh, after six months of priest prison. And I told him that I was gonna write a letter of relief of absence and work this uh, wellness plan uh, that, the, that the center had said and that I was gonna uh, work at a secular job and for the next year and then possibly get back to ministry the following year. Well, he warned me and he says, and he was a sage man. He's, he's seen a lot of priests leave the priesthood out of this situation before. And he said, Stephen, he said, if you do this, that is a legal grounds for the diocese to lay aside. That's a legal grounds. The diocese is actually doing an administrative move to get rid of you. You don't realize that they don't want you to be part of the diocese anymore. They don't want you to be part of uh, the clerical state anymore. They want to get rid of you, period. You need to get a canon lawyer right now and fight this. So again, I see the I see the issue. I'm up. I'm trying to fight the bishop, who's supposedly a successor of the apostles. Uh, he's nothing more than a eunuch and a hireling. He's a, he's incapable of spiritual fatherhood, and he's a hireling. He's a mercenary. He's paid off by the state to monitor the corporation. He's paid off by those higher than him uh, in the corporation to continue the the machine. I began fighting canonically, and some interesting notes. The bishop did not accept my canon lawyer. Uh, my, my family was paying for the canon lawyer, uh, and had, it spent, it took me, it took the diocese eight months, 10 months to actually give me an accusation of what I was there accusing me of directly, uh, which were false, uh, but they were direct to accuse me to get the canon law process going, but they denied my natural law right to self-defense. They did not let me use my canon lawyer. And for the first 10 months, it was, the argument was, let me use my canon lawyer. And they said, well, no canonical process is, is, is envisioned or engaged right now once you do your wellness plan. And I'm like, I'm not doing this crud. I'm not putting my vocation on the line. I work too far and too hard. And God has told me to offer the mass for the rest of my life. So I'm either going to do that in exile for the rest of my life, or I'm going to do that uh, fighting you in canon law, or I'm going to, at the time, or I'm going to go back into ministry, public ministry. So uh, of course, because the 1983 code of canon law is written by bishops for bishops uh, to be interpreted by bishops the way they want, uh, they can manipulate it however they want. And so the bishop still denied me my canon lawyer of choice. And then the bishop actually picked a canon lawyer that he went to seminary with, who's now a canon lawyer in a neighboring diocese. He drove over, came look at my case, and he called me the next day without my approval. And he told me, I have some questions for you looking at my case. And so he looked at my case and he said, you know, Father Stephen, you, there's nothing here. I don't find anything here that you're guilty of that should stop you from going back into ministry. And I said, well, thank you. You know, I appreciate that. He was honest. And this was a guy who was hired by my bishop at the time to actually go through the canonical process. And he said, you're not guilty of anything here. I mean, it was mal it was imprudent, you know, to, you know, put those teenagers on edge like that. But I mean, 
you can learn, you can learn not to do that very easily. So yeah, you're right. I learned it within two minutes, you know, being slapped on the wrist say, we don't hear confessions like that. Okay, fine. You know, I, I'll turn people away now if we're not, you know, disposed to go to confession and say, find an examination of conscience on the internet, look, go through it and come back whenever you properly examine your conscience. It's not, you know, and so that's the way that I, I you know, I, I approach it now if someone's not disposed with contrition and knowledge of their sins to confess them properly. So going, so this canonical process, I'll fast forward, was dragged out un, in an ungodly, inhumane manner uh, for four years. So five, five years total, I was in exile. I was offering mass at my grandparents' house, was able to live with them for a time, which was great in their old age. I was able to take care of them and offer them daily mass. And they had been attending Sunday mass their whole lives and never went to daily mass. And so I was able to go through a three-year cycle of the whole lectionary of the Novus Ordo Mass with them. It was at that time too, I started doing ad orientum masses, uh, facing the altar, facing God, not, not, not my family. Um, so I went from versus populum to ad orientum. Again, this is the idea of restoring the sacred. It was the idea of um, uh, reforming the reform. And so I went through a, a whole three year cycle. And it was, was we're now on, three and a half years to almost four years of exile. And I asked St. Joseph in a novena to put me back to work. So it was Labor Day weekend. And then the nine, the end, on the ninth day, a traditional minded priest in the diocese that I was at, uh, that, that I belonged to, I was living in the backyard of the, of the chancery, virtually in the shadow of the chancery, uh, unknown to many people, <laughs> you know, where I was hiding out, you know, sometimes the higher, the closer you hide to your enemies, the, the, not e the, the harder it is for them to find you. Uh, so I stayed within their backyard, uh, offering these private masses for my, for my family. Uh, and it was great to minister to my family. And I think God in his providence knew that I would not be seeing my family for a very long time. You know, once he would settle the dust, once the dust would settle, uh, and I would just explain it as I was in a desert. I asked God to open up doors. He said, Stephen, there's no doors in a desert. Just keep on walking. When you get out of the desert, there'll be a door. Trust me. And so uh, I was patiently waiting. Uh, there was a number of trials that happened in the desert. Again, the God sends manna, God sends quail. He sends many graces in the desert. Uh, there was also many consolations, one of which, uh, because I got to meet this traditional minded priest in the diocese, he reached out to me at the end of this nine day novena to St. Joseph. And he said, um, you know, how would you like to um, start ministering to real Catholics? And I said, well, that's, that's what I was ordained for. You know, I was ordained to minister to real Catholics. And so he introduced me uh, to the traditional Catholic community in my diocese, very small uh, community, but they're all homeschool families. They had large families. Uh, they had this great life of tradition uh, in rule of life that they were following, uh, all in line with uh, answering to the Novus Ordo Bishop, but they were all very much living a traditional life. Um, and it was through them that my life began to take on a whole new meaning. My priesthood took a, a whole new meaning and that it I never offered public ministry and sacraments for these people, but just to be able to talk to them, have dinner at their house, uh, be able to pray rosaries with them, uh, be able to catechize occasionally, uh, in very informal ways, um, um, to, to be able to walk alongside of them for the next year and a half, exposed me to other priests who would come in and pitch in from other dioceses. And I get to talk to these other priests who were covering the masses at this particular adult uh, parish. And so I heard it over the course of some very good priests who were traditional minded, and I would put them in the category of traditionalists, but they still answer to Novus Ordo bishops. Uh, they'll say it over and over again. We do not have the same religion with the Novus Ordo. And then we don't have the same religion with the Novus Ordo. It's two different religions. One has big families. One has contraceptive small families. One believes in the real presence of the Eucharist. The other one, uh, take it or leave it. You know, 70% say they don't believe. The uh, one, one religion says frequent sacrament of confession. Other one says, meh, I might get to it before I die. You know, one religion says uh, we need to respect and honor the priest and the priest should live an honorable and respectable life and present himself in public as a priest. And one 
uh, in the other religion, priests can wear lay clothes as often as they want, only when it's convenient or necessary for them to wear clerics, they do. And if it, you know, their golf game is more important than, than their theological studies. Uh, so th th overall, and, and of course the mass night and day, I mean, the, the traditional Latin mass versus the Novus Ordo mass is night and day. Um, one is centered on the sacrifice of Calvary, the self-same sacrifice of Calvary represented in perpetuity, uh, knowing that this is how God desires to be worshipped. And the other one is a Protestant worship service with a possible Eucharist attached. You know, and I say that and I say that because if priests don't have the intention of confecting the Eucharist, the Eucharist does not take effect. You know, so there are priests that in my former diocese that do not believe in the real presence. And for at least a few years, they were offering mass with yeasted bread. They didn't believe in the Eucharist. I mean, there was no valid Eucharist for a number of years, as long as this man was a pastor in that parish. There's a number of things which we could probably get into, but the getting finally to the traditionalist point that where I became a state of a contest became this. Uh, a year and a half, actually a year ago today, uh, today's the baptism, by the way, of uh, St. Augustine uh, in the martyrology. So it's a very important day of conversion. And it's also the feast day of the Saint, uh, Saint Fidelius, who was responsible for the propagation of the doctrine of faith, who was a martyr uh, for promoting the faith. And so in, I think in 16 something, he, he passed away in Germany, giving the Catholic faith to Protestants. Uh, many people were converted back to the faith. And it's just proof that Catholicism makes Catholics. Protestantism makes Protestants. And Protestantized Catholicism makes Protestantized pseudo-Catholics. OK, so uh, Catholicism works. The old evangelization works. It, 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 it evangelized America, the Americas, Africa, Asia, Europe, the world. The old evangelization works. There's no, there's no need for a new evangelization. You know, uh, if the Holy Ghost was locked up for so many centuries, then why were there so many conversions? You know, uh, so why were there so many saints? <laughs> Why, why was everybody in society geared and focused on God if the old evangelization wasn't working? Uh, again, we'll get to that later. But to continue on with the story uh, of how I became a, a traditionalist was that while I was in exile, apart from meeting this traditional minded priest and other traditional priests who were coming into the diocese to cover masses, I got exposed to other brother priests around the country in the Novus Ordo who were thrown away, just like myself. There's hundreds of us, uh, if not thousands, who were thrown away because, again, we're just employees and potential lawsuits. And so there is an organization that exists named Opus Bono Sacerdoti for the Good Work of Priests based out of Michigan uh, in the Archdiocese of Detroit. And they reach out to priests who are in exile and they do a lot of good work for uh, paying for canon lawyers uh, paying for uh, retreats to happen for priests that want to come and, and, and fraternalize with other brother priests who have been thrown away. And it was in this moment where I heard that my story was repeated over and over and over again. This was a playbook. Again, nothing just happens. These bishops don't just make these cruel decisions uh, on a whim. There's a playbook that they all follow. And so seeing that there were a number of priests at these retreats that obviously they should not be back in ministry. They did some some terrible things. They also had priests that were thrown out of ministry and they did not so terrible things. You know, like myself, I, I, I heard confessions uh, un, unfavorably without without proper disposition to hear them appropriately uh, with teenagers. But that was an easy fix. It wasn't like I was trying to do something creepy. You know, there's another priest not in ministry that was there. He was he was out of ministry because a woman actually came to his desk and she tried to make a move on him. And he pushed he, he pushed her off of her. And because she, he pushed her off of him and refused her advances, she made a claim that he sexually uh, harassed her. And this guy deserves to be back in ministry. It's ridiculous that he's not back in ministry. Uh, but again, he's still sidelined today. He went through his whole canonical process. And uh, this case came back from Rome Road and said, get this guy a job. And his archbishop said, well, I'm the chief shepherd of the diocese. And I say, you can't go back to ministry until another five years pass. And so uh, they, they begin this waiting game. They wait you out. They want you to quit, period. 
So realizing that, hey, you know, the Nis Novus Ordo, uh, or one, some people call it the Bogus Ordo, I, I'm actually more apt to say that, uh, that the Bogus Ordo bishops, they want you to quit. So, hey, well, okay, you want me to quit, but I'm not going to quit the priesthood. So I'm going to one-up you. <laughs> okay, so at these retreats, I went to three of them uh, and it inspired me to find some way of resisting. How can I make a response, an active response, other than having the come together and group hug with these other priests that are, you know, out of ministry, how can we make a unified response to tell these bishops they're in the wrong here? They're destroying the church. They're destroying the priesthood. They have no love for the salvation of souls. And they have no love of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are not living up to their calling as apostles if they are successors of the apostles. If, if they are, they're, they're, they're drastically compromising with Caesar in the world to where I don't want any part of this. And I, re and I had to see, okay, I had to make a decision. If the diocese that I was from, because my, my case came back from Rome, and I have not seen what the, what, I, and I had to make a decision in my head before even Rome came back with the decision on my case, whether I should go back to ministry or not, and, and, and their findings, whatever have you. I already know those findings. I already know what's going to happen. I already know I'm innocent, and I know the diocese is not going to give me a job. I know that they're going to want me to go through all these psychological hoops, turn me inside out like a pretzel, to go through the brainwashing all over again to try to get me on board with the Novus Ordo propaganda machine. And I cannot, I'm in a position in my, in my life where I believe 100% the deposit of faith. I believe in the papacy. I believe uh, in the real presence. I believe in the sacramental powers of the faith. And because I believe in the reverence in the right worship and right order of Catholicism in tradition, I do not have a job in the Novus Ordo. I want to repeat that again. I do not have a job. I will not find a bishop to take me in because I believe 100% of the deposit of faith. If in not to boot, I'm a white American Catholic male, you know, which is, uh, again, another strike against me. I'm not just full, full bull Catholic. I'm also a, a white American straight male, you know, so this is what the left, uh, you know, wants to destroy. They want to destroy Christendom. And when I realized they want to destroy Christendom, they want to destroy the faith. And all you needed was the scandemic to show what was happening. I mean, they, they, the, the wolves revealed themselves. The, the wool was taken off and the wolves came out and the devil was able to feast. And people died without the sacraments of Holy Mother Church. And people were left abandoned and now worshiping God through uh, dots on a screen. Instead of the God who became flesh, we now tell God, people to receive God through dots on a screen. And just let that sink in. It totally defies the, the principle of the incarnation. It's not Catholic. So, the, so seeing that I had no job, but any Nova Sordo bishop, People will say, well, you're a traditionalist. How about you go to the Fraternal Society of St. Peter? And again, I don't have anything stopping me civilly. The civil laws already checked me out. I'm, I'm not a threat to society. I'm not a threat to the youth. Uh, even Rome says I'm not a threat to the youth. All right. My people that experience me, they, they know I'm not a threat to anybody, uh, to their well-being. Uh, but because the U.S. Country Club of Bishops are lockstep together, if you're not accepted by one bishop, you're not accepted by any bishops. And the Fraternal Society of St. Peter is still lock and step with the Novus Ordo bishops. OK, I want you to let that sink in. They listen to the wolves. They're listening to the wolves. They're listening to the modernists. OK, they're not they're not listening and answering ultimately to Christ. They want to say they're being obedient to the apostolic succession. There are 80 bishops in this world that still carry on apostolic succession with the full deposit of faith that do not compromise the faith. There are still 80 such bishops with proper holy orders, with proper rites, consecrated bishops, not ordained bishops. And there's a distinction. Maybe that can be another discussion for another time because that, that is huge because Vatican II changed not just the mass, of ordinations. And so knowing that um, uh, I don't have a job with the Fraternal Society of St. Peter, 
uh, in some some society of St. Pius X, because they're trying to get on board with, uh, and they have proper orders. They're trying to get on board with Rome and say, please take us back. Please be in, let's be in communion with one another, but let us keep our tradition. And they won't take somebody like me because I'm not accepted by the country club. So then that allowed uh, another situation to, uh, to unfold to where when I went to the last retreat on this Opus Bonus Sacerdote retreat, the third retreat I had attended, I met a brother priest who was there, who was a state of contest. And he told me that he had a parish and he told me that he had uh, two, a mission church too, and that he was doing a lot of good work, you know? And he said, the best thing you can do is leave, just walk away. They don't have the faith. Come follow priests and bishops that have the faith. And he invited, he invited me, introduced me to uh, Bishop Joseph Masick, who is of the Tuke line, uh, Archbishop Tuke. Uh, for those that don't know, was from Vietnam. He was consecrated a bishop by Pope Pius XI, and Pope Pius XII was one of the co-consecrating cardinals at his Episcopal consecration. He was given a mandate to consecrate bishops without Rome's approval because he was going back into communist Vietnam. Well, with the change of this, uh, that happened at the Second Vatican Council, Archbishop Lefebvre of happy memory and Archbishop Tuke uh, decided that they would begin preserving the authentic expression of the traditional Catholic faith that was in lockstep with all the popes before Vatican II uh, to endure the entire deposit of faith in the traditional rites. And so Archbishop II consecrated six bishops, three in Mexico and three in, in France. Uh, one of the bishops in France is the lineage of which Archbishop uh, Masick received his Episcopal consecration. Uh, he himself was in the Novus Ordo, and he made it very easy for me after meeting with him uh, to understand this transition from the Novus Ordo world and Novus Ordo bishops to traditional bishops. And so uh, I received, uh, knowing that I had gone through all the formation of the priesthood in the Novus Ordo, I have a philosophy degree, I have a theology degree, I have a master's in divinity. Um, <clears throat> knowing that I have a lot of pastoral experience, he was able to ordained me properly to the priesthood of Jesus Christ on uh, December 10th, 2020. And thus began uh, the journey find today, which is very recent. Additionally? Yes, it was, it was conditional ordination. And people will ask, you know, why go through ordinate, a conditional ordination? And, well, it comes from Pope Leo XIII and in, in his encyclical that dealt with handling Anglican uh, priests who were converting to the Catholic faith, who wanted to remain Catholic, who wanted to become Catholic priests, they had to be reordained um, because they had lost the right. They changed the, the Anglican church, changed the right of ordination and thus invalidating uh, the priestly line of succession, the apostolic line of succession. So they had no real bishops and no real priests. They did this for a hundred years after Henry VIII broke from Rome. Uh, for this hundred years, they did not have valid bishops or priests that were being to renew the old priests and bishops. So when the old priests and bishops died a hundred years later, they had no more apostolic succession. They said, oh no, we did a wrong thing here. So they restored the old rite. And in doing it, restoring the old rite, they did not validate the priesthood in the episcopacy because they had no more valid bishops and priests. So when you change the rite, Saint, saint, uh, not saying he should be a saint. If, if, if John the 23rd could be a saint, Leo the 13th could be a saint. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. That's all, that's all I'm trying to say, you know, but they have, we'll cover that what it takes for a Pope to be a saint before Vatican II. You actually had to do a, a living mir a miracle while alive. Now you don't have to do a miracle while you're alive to be a Pope saint. Uh, but the, the stricter for Popes to be saints in the, in the, in tradition than it is actually in the Novus Ordo. Uh, but to, to not lose track, let's see. Leo XIII said, because this is not uh, what the church intends when it was doing its ordinations, when the Anglicans and the Episcopalians were doing the ordinations, it's not what the church intended, it was not valid. You get what you ask for. In other words, if you're not asking for God to make this man a priest, if you're not asking for God, God to make this man the fullness of a priest, you're going to get what you ask for in response. So, uh, Pope Leo XIII did that, and he said it's right and necessary and just to conditionally ordain when there is seen as doubt, when there it's doubtful. Uh, so knowing that a previous Pope, Leo XIII of happy memory, uh, you know, said that in his encyclical, 
It's on the nullity of Anglican orders. And it was written in, uh, it was about 18, 1890 something. So I guess to continue, so whenever I, uh, in 2000, in 2012, uh, 20, at the end of that year, I was ordained conditionally to the um, traditional Catholic priesthood, to the Catholic priesthood, uh, the same priesthood, uh, just done with the proper right, uh, so to make sure it's done with the mind of the church, to make sure any shore up any doubts, that there is any uh, invalidity in what I was doing before, it shored up anything so that, because uh, Catholic teaching, it's a good practice that if we have any doubts that what we're doing is not the right thing, then we need to take rid of all doubt. Otherwise, it becomes sacrilegious. So uh, I do not want to offer sacrilegious masses, knowing that I was ordained in the Novus Ordo by a Novus Ordo bishop who was ordained to the Episcopacy by other Novus Ordo bishops who had changed the rites of ordination and Episcopal consecration. And so having a proper lineage of order became that much more important to me uh, to take away all doubts and to also open up the world of possibilities for my priestly ministry. Uh, if I wanted to continue into ministry as a Catholic priest, um, you know, I needed to be conditionally reordained. Now, the, now people ask about validity. Well, I'll say, that, I'll, I'll say this. I was a valid Novus Ordo priest, and now I'm a valid traditional priest. All right. So I'll just snip it in the bud right there that everything I did, according to the Novus Ordo, I was valid and everything now I'm doing in tradition is now valid. And so uh, but I do not hold on to the old. Uh, I'm not the old. Um, I say the old man. I left go the old man. I'm now part of the new man.